Alright, hold on to your seats, motherfuckers. We got a lot to talk about today. And we're also doing something unique. I'm hoping, I mean, obviously you're going to notice that different shit is going down. But so I'm just going to, you know, you're going to see what's going on. But please, <laughs> give me a little lenience in regard to any kinks that occur, anything awkward that may happen. But you know, you're going to tell. So the first thing that I want to talk about, you should see it now on your screen. Um... Monsieur Zaccarado asked me a question, well, not, didn't necessarily ask me a question, but made a request about some my opinion regarding uh, the potential lack of strong single-player narrative in AAA games nowadays. And so to kind of just do like a too-long-didn't-read summarization of my opinion on the matter, absolutely I think there is a lot less emphasis on story-driven um, experiences in AAA gaming. However, that's not that's nothing to do with, you know, like studios trying to cash in on first person shooters, which, you know, don't care about stories. It doesn't it's not well that's part of it. But there's a bunch of different elements that combine to cause this. It's not just, you know, you can't just point at one thing and be like, yo, these people fucked everything up. And so, you know, just to kind of get into it real quick, I'm not gonna get because I don't wanna sp I could spend probably like two hours just talking about this shit, and I would like to not <laughs> talk that much that's a little too much but so basically to kind of you know uh explain a bit further about that whole genre popularity thing there are certain do i mean basically i think it's largely due to the increasing uh importance of multiplayer that certain game types like first person shooters or third person just any kind of shooters have risen in popularity to basically become the most played games in the world like the call of duty every single year is basically the best-selling game of the year it's just how it is unless like pokemon comes out um and so and that's not necessarily a bad thing but this is a shooting game and the shooters have never had a heavy emphasis on stories and the rise in popularity of shooting games is thanks to the increasing availability and uh strength of internet for people so they can play multiplayer a lot and then you also have mmorpgs obviously world of warcraft is the first one that comes to mind if you ever talk about massively multiplayer online shit uh mobas obviously league of legends is basically almost there is very very rare if you go to twitch to not see league of legends as the top watched stream uh Games, the top streamed game on Twitch. Dota is always up there as well. And none of these have a heavy emphasis on story. They have a heavy emphasis on gameplay. And so a lot of people kind of see this and go, oh, well, shit, let me throw my hat into that ring. Like, look, you if you go to Steam and you look at how many MMOs are out there, it is absurd. And yet none of them are even moderately successful in comparison to World of Warcraft. And yet people still keep throwing their money at trying to develop their own that could compete with it. And not once has anybody ever come close. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But anyway, so a large part of it is thanks to certain genres that are not story focused in the first place growing in popularity. Uh, the second thing, I think a large part of it is the development of technology actually hinders active storytelling because... It increases your availability for immersion into your own story. Look at experiences like anything from From Software, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Skyrim, uh, basically any of the Elder Scrolls games. Fallout a little bit less because Fallout always did have a little bit stronger of a story than the Elder Scrolls series. I'm kind of looking around trying to see. I mean, basically, you know, GTA is another one, even though GTA is known for having a pretty strong core story as well. Anything that can kind of be considered an open world game is far there's a far heavier emphasis on basically creating your own story rather than having a story told to you and i don't think you can just dismiss that out of hand as being like oh well it's not a uh, strong single player narrative and so it doesn't count if you wrote down your experiences in these kinds of games like i said in games like skyrim or bloodborne and you put and you basically created a book out of it let's say you just used those story elements to create a book it would actually be a really fascinating fictional book i really believe that and everybody's gonna be a little bit different you know like in those games you're given the same foundation but you're not really given 
a specific, you know, this is how the world works, this is how the world ends, this is exactly what occurs, and there is no possible divergence from this. And I think that ability to just immerse yourself in this world and have a character that is actually like a living part of this world that affects it is such a strong element to gaming nowadays that you just that's kind of replaced uh the whole you know running through and having just you know playing a story with some gameplay behind it now it's you're playing a game with the bare basics of a story to allow you to build upon it for yourself so i think that's a really strong thing that you have to mention up that you have to mention up that needs to be brought up i mixed together like four different sayings in that sentence i hate it when that happens another thing we're growing up like our standards every single year that goes by our standards get a little bit higher we experience more things we now are able to compare you know certain elements to more things because of those experiences and now experiences that used to be you know like oh my god this is so amazing are now like wow this is actually not that good and my own personal opinion of this I have uh, there's one of the first games I played on the original Xbox was a game called Azeric. Azeric? I don't know how to pronounce it. Rise of Parathia. This is one of the first console games I ever, well, outside of Sega Genesis. But, you know, when consoles were coming up, I skipped, uh, you know, the GameCube era. I skipped the Nintendo 64 era. I only had a Sega Genesis. Then I only had Nintendo Portables up until I got an Xbox. And so this Azeric game was one of the first console games I played. And to me, this was amazing. I had this wide open world to explore. Uh, I had all kinds of different elemental effects to play with. I thought this was the best experience in the world, other than I kept getting lost all the goddamn time, and I had to buy a guide to figure out where the fuck to go. <laughs> it was not It was not a well-built game, and I'm going to get to that. So for me, because I didn't have a huge amount of experience with games of this type, I didn't understand that this was actually a pretty bad game, comparatively. But to me, it was the most amazing thing in the world. And then, you know, as I'm growing up, I kind of go back to it and kind of think, you know, like, is it nostalgia that's making me think these? Oh, hell yes, it's nostalgia. This game is awful. It got like a 5 out of 10 uh, average rating. It's not a well-regarded game. And But to me, I, like I said, that was some of the greatest enjoyment I had back then because it was one of the first console experiences that had a large world to explore and I had never had anything like that before. It was amazing to me. And so I do think that's a large part of it as well is that as we get older, as our, our understanding of various things grows, we just have higher standards and now things that used to cut it don't cut it anymore. And so that has to, you know, you have to factor that into things as well. Um, and so hopefully you're going to be seeing a little bit of a clip here now. Ori in the Blind Forest. This is a game that is not, it's not terribly recent, but it is fairly recent. One of the most emotional openings to a game. It is like the up of gaming. If you have seen the beginning of up, you know exactly what I'm talking about, where it just takes a hold of your heart and squeezes it tries its hardest to break it right out the fucking gate and it was this it's this very emotional experience which i have to admit even in games that do deliver a very strong narrative that emotional aspect of it that part of me that just wants to be like yo this poor thing you know even not just necessarily sadness anger happiness Sadness, all of those things combined, all of those emotions, I feel those so rarely in games nowadays. Like, I can enjoy the hell out of a game, but never actually feel any kind of emotion during it. Something like, for instance, Devil May Cry or Bayonetta, Ninja Gaiden, any of those games, I'm sitting there like, oh my god, this is so fun, this is a fantastic experience, this is testing all of my reflexes to challenge, this is a fantastic game, but there's no emotional investment in the experience whereas with Ori and the Blind Forest that shit hooked me within five minutes immediately was just like yo keep playing this figure out what happens to this poor thing hopefully you get a happy ending and um, obviously I'm not I haven't actually gotten to the ending myself I still need to play it. I'm terrible at uh, playing PC games for some reason I just I always forget about them so I play them for like an hour then I forget them for a week and I play them for another hour so I'm terrible at finishing those motherfuckers but um, anyway 
that beforehand i'm kind of just glancing up at my game collection honestly mass effect is the only other series i see that really managed to hit me like that no other no, none of the other games that i've played have gotten any kind of emotional investment from me and yet i think about mass effect and you got to think about that uh in mass effect 3 that tolly vs legion thing morden um in Mass Effect 2, Jack's whole, just basically Jack, like, looking at what she's experienced in her life, um, there's all kinds of just moment-to-moment -moment things throughout the entire Mass Effect series, which were unfortunately backhanded right out the door with the goddamn ending, but I'm gonna get to that in a bit, and yet there were so many moments throughout that which just hit me from, on an emotional level, which made me sit back and, like, I actually had to take a break because it was actually draining on me because of the emotional investment I had in these characters that were so well written and so basically alive. I mean, despite, you know, obviously all of these shortcomings, uh, the lack of continuity thanks to uh, so many choices being available, they kind of just shoehorned in like all the Mass Effect 2 characters and Mass Effect 3. But, you know, despite all the shortcomings, it still had so many emotional moments that were really impactful. And I think that's a large thing that's been lost as well. They're just, you know, Final Fantasy VII. One of the most memorable moments. I don't even know the goddamn character's name. But I know that girl who dies and everybody was like, What? Oh my god! Like, how, how, have you ever seen any moment, any necessarily explosion of emotion comparative to that? I haven't. Unless you talk about, like, anger toward how a game ends up coming out, but it's not, like, actually feeling anything because of the game. It's, you know, disappointment. And people just rushing to the internet to express their anger at it. And so it's not really the same. Um, and so let me just, let me just try. And I'm trying to figure out where I'm at right now. Oh, right. So, anyway, the business side of things. Like I said, some people are kind of, you know, rushing shit out the door. Triple A games especially take so much money to make nowadays that no studio can just be like, "Hey, we're just going to make a we're just going to make a game on the st on the scale of Mass Effect and it'll be fine. We totally have the budget for that." Uh-uh. They need investors. They need business people behind it. And the problem is when these business people put their money behind it, they get a say in how shit works, especially when you're going to one of the huge studios like EA or Activision or any of those kind of, you know, who really who really cares, the names of them. Um, but when you have this board of directors behind it who only care about the profit line, they're not gamers themselves, they just see a potential return on an investment, they don't care if you haven't had the time necessary to fine-tune your story. They do not care if you need an extra three months of development time. They want that shit on the shelves by holiday season and damn the consequences. And that's when you get something like Mass Effect 3. Like, you just look at the entire experience of Mass Effect 3. Everything that it was, all of the amazing moment-to-moment -moment scenarios with the characters and consequences for your actions and just, you know, you're seeing Earth, the place that you live right now, under assault, and you need to save that shit. And then it comes to such an abrupt halt. Do you really think that was the ending that Bioware wanted? I don't think it was. I don't think they wanted to do that shit at all. I think they had to because they didn't have time. And they just said, yo, we need to wrap this up. And we just, we have to. There's nothing we can do. We need to do this as simply and as quickly as possible. And they did it. And I think that's a huge impact on uh, what's available now is budget and the say of the upper, you know, the suits, basically. What they what their input is. And it's an unfortunate aspect of it, but it's just how it is. But then you also, I think one of the biggest things that prevents a real, uh, just AAA story-driven experience is the expectations of gamers. I think that's the biggest thing. You can have the best story written in the world. It could be something that would win. Like if you put it into a book, 
it would win whatever awards are out there for whatever genre the book would be in. If you made it into a movie, it would win Golden Globes out the ass, or which Oscars are, I don't know which one's more important, I don't really care. If you made it into a goddamn music album, it would win awards for that. That's how good this story is. And yet, if it's five hours long, gamers will dismiss it out of hand. They will not care. And that is why you're seeing such an emphasis on strong story-driven experiences in indie games. Because people are fine with that. Oh, it's an indie game. It doesn't have to be 20 hours plus long. Or have multiplayer shoehorned in. Who cares? We're perfectly fine with this. Because it's an indie game. It's the expectation behind it. Nobody now will accept a AAA game that is just as long as it needs to be. And so because of that, you're never really going to see another extremely strong story-driven uh, game, which is just that story by itself. That's why that's been relegated to indie games nowadays, is because of the gamers. Is because they know if it comes out, if it comes out and it's said, yo, this is just a five-hour long game, nobody's going to care. Look at The Order 1886. Now, personally, I haven't played that game. I don't know how effective that game's story is. From what I know, that is a deeply flawed, very poor game that was hyped up far too much as being, like, the next medium of proper storytelling, and then it ended up being, like, really ineffective at it. Despite that, the biggest hit that game took before it came out was the story that released about somebody beating it in, like, 30 minutes or something like that. And because of that, because somebody could beat it in 30 minutes, plus it was only about five hours long, nobody cared about anything else. It was just the length. All these motherfucking men out there in the world try to tell you, length doesn't matter, it's how you use it, and yet you run the games, length matters. Bitches, I'm gonna end right on that, because that's the perfect thing to end on. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, I do, I think just the, uh, combination of all of those elements has led to has led to it so absolutely yes i believe there are significantly less story driven triple a narrative experiences and that is the fault of almost everybody involved in the entire process it's not just you know any one group of people it's just basically caused there to be a dearth of this entire uh of effective writing so you know, let me get a drink first before i continue on So I have this shit right, I have this shit written down, and I'm just going to read it off exactly as I have it written. Bloodborne expansion, woo! Please don't be chalice dungeon based. I don't have anything else beside that. There's nothing else that I have to talk about, because I don't, I'm not going to go into, um, number, it would take me too long if I just started to basically guess, like, this is what I wanted out of it, this is what I hope it is, this is what I hope it isn't, this is what I hope it involves, I hope there's like 30 more weapons and blah blah blah, like, it's irrelevant, I just hope it's good, I really do, and if it's Chalice Dungeon based, I will probably dismiss it out of hand, because Chalice Dungeons have been some of the most boring things I've ever been through in my life, <laughs> like, the, some of the bosses were very interesting, but the problem is, every single boss almost actually i'm trying to think of the thumerian descendant is unique to the dungeon um i mean i think you can argue that the abhorrent beast is unique to the dungeon because who it is possible to encounter him in the main story but how many people actually have i never did i never even knew that dude if you attacked him he would turn into the abhorrent beast i had no idea the entire time until somebody basically said like oh my god this dude went nuts and then, oh shit okay but like i've never done that myself so the chalice dungeon was my first experience with the abhorrent beast obviously you have the thumerian queen at the very end who is uh responsible for an achievement but i'm trying to think was there anybody the keeper of the old lords do i don't think you experience him um outside of the main game and watchdog as well i think those four are entirely unique to chalice dungeons but outside of that almost everything you fight is a recycled boss basically just shoved into like a smaller arena or something like that which is not that's not fun that's not enjoyable for anybody so yeah i just i really hope that uh it's not chalice dungeon based guilty gear update what's it called revelator or something like that 
hey, we'll see what happens. You know, I mean, apparently there, uh, Johnny's coming back, which I don't really care about. I would not play him. I think, honestly, the only two characters that I would play from the original Guilty Gear cast, not the original Guilty Gear cast, but, you know, the cast before XR came out and they had to cut it down because they didn't have the budget to animate all of them in the new animation style, Zappa and Testament, I think, are the biggest two. I mean, you know, there's certainly other characters that I might try, but those are the two that's like, for sure, if they get released, I'm playing these motherfuckers. As it stands, I've always meant to go back to Guilty Gear and uh, pick up Sin and really try to use Sin to an effective level, but unfortunately, I just, I've never really gotten to it. I don't really have any excuse. It's not like I don't have the time for it. I just, I've never really had that level of investment in it to really sit down and be like, yo, I really want to play this. Um, and from what I've heard, Guilty Gear's online's a little dead, which makes sense because uh, Extend obviously came out, um, is available now. And we may as well go on to that after this, but yeah, Extend is available now to be imported from Japan. So, and that's how the anime community works, unfortunately. I could go on for that for hours too, about how much I hate it that the anime community as at large basically just abandons uh, whatever game previously came out whenever a new one comes out. They, it's just, it's gone. Like, the moment a new one comes out, the online for every other anime game is just a wasteland, immediately. And that really sucks for continued support. And that's kind of why, I think that's a large reason why Arc System Works does what it does. Um, where they're basically constantly, you know, like, they're... The game hasn't even been out on console for, like, a month now. And they're talking about an update for it already. And, like, they just... They get their money off of the arcade, so a large part of it is trying to keep the arcade players interested. But it's still just, you know, the... Everybody knocks Street Fighter. Oh, they've been through, like, seven iterations since 2009. Like, the anime games are so much worse. The anime games are worse. Completely. And entirely. And the anime games charge you almost full price every single time. At least Street Fighter offers the option to upgrade. Or even now, they're offering Ultra Street Fighter 4 with all DLC involved on the PS4 for $25. Which is largely because they probably paid absolutely nothing to get that shitty, terrible port out on shelves. Oh my god, It's apparently it has a consistent 8 frames of input lag, no matter what you do. Um, I don't, I don't want to get into it too much, but yeah, that port is a fucking mess. So I guess you can't really point to them as like, hey, look at what you... I mean, it really feels like they just went out and were like, hey, who can we pay the least to do this port for us? Those guys, let's do it. And that's what they did, and they did a terrible job. But so anyway, um, so let's talk about Blaze Blue a little bit. Uh, obviously, I've been getting questions here and there about whether or not I'm going to get Extend, and I'm, I'm not going to import it. It's $50 to import it. I refuse... I completely, utterly refuse to pay that price for another Blaze Blue. I have paid that much money, or $60, for every single Blaze Blue release up to this, except for the previous Extend. I have paid for every single version before this. And it's basically for a story mode I couldn't care less about. That's, that's what the majority of that money is going toward. It's not the rebalance. It's not the new characters. It's the fucking story mode. And so I'm not going to pay that. I refuse to continue supporting uh, this kind of release schedule and pay almost full price or definitely full price for these games. Fuck it. Fuck Arc System Works for continuing that pricing model. Like, I'm just... I can't... The only... I can sit here... And I can bash them endlessly as much as I would like to. And that is nowhere near as effective as just plain not buying the game and costing them another sale. Simple as that. And so it really, I mean, it's, it sucks too because I don't really, that's my main reason for not buying the game is because I refuse to continue to support Arc System Works' business practices. Because, I mean, like I said, Capcom is eating so much shit. For their DLC programs and for their continued re uh, re-releases and all that shit. And yet Arc System Works is doing the same exact thing with like double the price point. I mean you look at like Street Fighter Cross Tekken, right? That's one of the Capcom's like most hated on recent releases. Uh, especially fighting game wise it's definitely their most hated on recent release. And yet they offered, was it 12 DLC characters for $20? If that was an Arc System Works pricing model, 
That would have been $96. It's $8 per DLC character for Arc System Works. The only time that has ever been any different is for when Atlas was involved. And I'm assuming they basically said, no, not $8, $5. And it's infuriating to see them continue to get away with this with so little backlash. Just because like people know this is their only avenue for it. Like, this is not a major company that can handle, you know, a bunch of uh, backlash, that can handle a bunch of negative publicity. They're not Capcom. They're not, they haven't survived for, like, 30 years of gaming. 30 years is a bit much. 20 years of gaming. However long they've been around. And, uh, it really, I just, I really hate it. Because they are continuing to get away with it. They keep doing it. They're not going to stop doing it. And it absolutely infuriates me. And that's why I'm not buying Extend. I may get it from Gamefly just to try it out, but the problem is, despite all the, you know, if you ignore all of the business shit, everything I just said about uh, business and all of that shit, um, you get into... Sorry, 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 something's popping up and I need to get rid of it. Um, If you get into... Shit, what was I talking about? The balancing of the game. They have made every single character that I play more boring, more dull. And I mean, I know a lot of people have been like, hey, Nate, Tager's A tier now, aren't you excited? No. No, I'm not. The, and here's the reason why he's A tier. It's because he got better at blowing up the characters that he already was good at blowing up. It doesn't matter how effective you make Tager, because he will always get blown up by the same 50% of the cast that he always gets blown up by. And he will always destroy the 50% of the cast he has always destroyed. It's just a matter of degrees. How badly is he going to destroy these people? And how much of a chance does he have of bullshitting out a win against these guys? Versus like, oh, he actually gave... the Arc System Works actually gave you tools to handle his negative matchups without like absolutely destroying the chances of the other 50% of the cast that he already destroys. And so that's kind of uh, Justin Wong in a past Excellent Adventures mentioned, bite was talking about Bison. How he's a very good character, a very fun character to play, but how he's never going to win a tournament. Because he just gets blown up so badly by certain other characters. Like I think Rose was one of the ones that was mentioned. Or the twins, I believe, were the other two that were specifically mentioned. It's the same exact thing with Tager. You will never win a tournament with Tager when there are Hazuma players, there are new players, to a certain extent Valkenhayn players. Out of all the characters that he gets blown up by, Valkenhayn I definitely feel like he has the best chance against. Lychee, Taukaka, Rachel, so many characters just annihilate this dude. And you're just not going to be able to beat them at some points. And you're just, it's just going to be hopeless. I hate character designs like that. I'm done with feeling like I'm absolutely hopeless in certain matchups. I hate that. So I could not care less if Tager is considered S plus tier, A tier, or E tier. I will always consider him to be a deeply flawed character that will never win a tournament. I am putting that on fucking record. Tager will never win a tournament of note. I don't care if Hase goes there, I don't care if Grandia goes there, there will never be a tournament of note won by a Tager player. Straight up. Simple as that. Now, obviously, you know, you saw if you watched my uh, Chrono Phantasma videos, I kind of basically almost entirely stopped using Asriel at the end of that, and I kind of basically solely stuck to Bullet and Tager. And that's because I just, I got bored with him. And they made him more boring. And so that's not going to change. And then you also look at Bullet. Bullet's a boring character. Apparently, I'm fantastic at picking boring-ass characters in Blaze Blue. But so the simple fact is, is that if I do end up getting Extend, I'm probably going to end up learning a new character. Learning the character that I've always wanted to learn and just, you know, never really did because I didn't have the motivation to. Which is kind of counterintuitive given that I have absolutely zero motivation to care about Extend. So who knows how that's going to happen. But I'm just saying, like, with Extend, it's very unlikely that anything good will come of, uh that game for me specifically and so now let me get a drink of water now we get into they're already talking about an update for the game Mori has already come out and said that he's considering the final basically you know because obviously it's the same exact release uh state as 
Continuum Shift was. You had CS, then CS2, then uh, Extend, same thing. You have CP, now CP2, and then now you have Extend, and now they're moving on to the next game. And he's talking about, let me actually pull up the actual, um, oh, did that not work? Does that not work? Fine. Fine. <laughs> I'm using Notepad++ and it highlights the uh, links and it makes them clickable, but apparently clicking on them does not actually open it up in a browser. So let me just copy paste that. So let me just do the title here. New Blaze Blue, due in 2016, may feature tag team battles over 30 characters. Creator Toshimichi Mori seeks fan feedback. So basically, the big part of this isn't necessarily the uh, over 30 characters, because obviously they're going to include more characters. That's just an inevitability. Of course they are. Uh, it's the tag team thing. Terrible idea. Terrible, atrocious, dumb idea, and here is why. He is walking into a series that has been ongoing for six years now that has never once had any kind of tag team ideas behind it the design simply is not there this is not design he's talking about you know like oh we could make it you know like maybe like capcom versus snk2 or we can make it like tech and tag tournament and you're talking about all these games other games that have that shit marvel king of fighters all of these games are inherently designed to be these tag team fights blaze blue is not so there is no possible way that you can make a non completely fucking broken uh version of a tag team fighting piece of blaze blue unless you completely change everything that blaze blue is about which has a chance of alienating your entire fan base because they have come to grow and uh love the game that you created now even though you know there's some rocky fucking bumps in there anything with the term extend in it <laughs> fucking terrible word i hate that now um but so you either have to do that or like he said you just put in you just make it so you can choose two or three characters and then that's that you're basically just playing the same exact game but you're picking two or three characters instead of one why what's the point why would you do that why would you shoehorn that in nobody wants to like everybody has their main nobody wants to sit back and learn you know like three characters to a level of mastery especially in a game as diverse as this is with characters that are you know as difficult to learn with the kind of character specific combos counter hit specific combos that all are like 30 plus hits you will see a huge amount of people like Azriel's, Tagers, Ragnas, characters that are very easy to pick up and play and you will immediately see a complete and utter lack of the complicated characters that take a ton of effort to be good with solely because you have to have all three characters of yours at a similar level to be able to compete with somebody else who's picking three characters and so plain and simple I don't think there's any possible way that a tag team element can work in blaze blue while keeping the game blaze blue it will be a completely different game if they make an effective tag team element and if it's not a completely different game it will not be an effective tag team element like look at it this way could you imagine having a game in uh in blaze blue that worked like tekken tag tournament 2 where you can get a hit with one character and then tag in a new character just think about that shit think about characters who are specifically inherently designed to be fully capable of opening somebody up like whenever possible they have all the tools in the world characters like rachel or valkenheim who can just at a moment's notice just rip you up rip your defense apart but the caveat to those characters is that they don't do a ton of damage they don't hurt very much they have to open you up a bunch of times but then you tag into somebody like asriel or like tarumi with full meter or you know any of the other hakuman obviously is probably the most obvious um example of this some character that can go from this other character opening you up with like seven mix-ups in a row into this character they can pull 6k out of their ass from nowhere you think that'll be balanced hell no it won't be it is impossible to balance that with blaze blue's current mechanics and so i think honestly i think mori is bored i think mori is bored and he's perfectly willing to ruin his own game 
just on a dice roll to think, oh, maybe I can do this instead of just making something new. And it's stupid of him. But let's be honest, he's done a lot of stupid things, so expecting, you know, expecting him to not do another retarded thing is just way out of uh, expectations at this point. So I'm just saying, like, I really fucking hope that he doesn't do it because it will be... I just, I see no possible way that Blaze Blue as it is can have that kind of element and have it remain Blaze Blue. Simple as that. So that's what I think about Blaze Blue, and that comes to the end of our topics. So I'm glad. I was thinking that I, I mean, I could have easily turned this into like an hour and a half to two hours long <laughs> if, I, if I really went like terribly in depth with all of this stuff. So anyway, hopefully this was uh, an enjoyable kind of. Uh, experiment I suppose that you know like what I did here is uh, effective for this kind of you know podcast-ish kind of a thing so anyway thank you for listening Uh, if you have anything you would like for me to talk about please feel free to ask and I will definitely note it down and I'll talk about it next time peace